Thank you, Jesus, for salvation through your shed blood. Romans chapter 6. Ooh. Romans chapter 6. In Romans 1, verse, verse 1 through Romans 3, verse 20, God brought all the world in, showed them why they were lost and condemned and without hope. It created in those who believed what God said a desire for salvation. So in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through chapter 5, God showed man how he could be saved. And what that, what that has done, should do, it creates in those who believe God a desire to live for Him. Amen. Seeing how we are lost is supposed to create in us a desire to be saved. Seeing how we are saved is supposed to create in us a desire to live for the Savior. The Bible says in Romans 6 and verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verse 15, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. There are only two responses to a proper understanding that God has saved me by my grace and not by my works. The one response is, if I'm saved by grace, I'll just keep sinning and sinning and sinning and bragging on the grace of God. The other response is, if sin was so terrible and sin was so hurtful and God went to such measures to save me from sin, why would I keep doing it? Now that God has provided me power and victory and grace and salvation so that I no longer have to do those things. Reading a little bit uh, farther in our context, verse number 3 says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. We'll talk about that tonight. Therefore, we are baptized, buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When Christ died, he died with all of our sin upon him. When Christ rose from the dead, he had no sin upon him. If we are dead and buried with Christ, have we been raised up to live the same old life? Have we been raised up to walk in the same old sins? Or have we not been raised up to walk in a new way and to live a new life? That certainly is the teaching of the passage. The Bible says in verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, are you saved? Have you been buried with Christ and, and raised up to live a new life, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That's pretty simple. Here's what you would ask. You would ask the average, not the average Christian, you would ask, 95% of the professing Christians, why were you saved? And they would say, to go to heaven. Why were you saved? And they would say, so I don't have to go to hell. Which just shows that people come to God on their terms, not on His terms. And that people walk away from having come to God on their terms, not on His terms. The Bible never, ever, ever, ever says, if you get saved, you get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. If you are saved and die today, you will go to heaven for a little while. Then you'll come back to earth for a little while. 
and then God will do away with the heaven you went to and the earth that you went to and start the whole thing all over again. So we're obviously not saved to go to heaven. The Bible says we are saved so God can deliver us from sinning. We are saved to stop sinning. Now the great thing about heaven is, when we, when we do get there, that we will finally, fully, completely, forever stop sinning. Amen. The great thing about heaven is not that it's prettier than earth. The great thing about heaven is it's not more expensive than earth. None of those are in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. The great thing about heaven is that nobody up there is sinning. There's no sickness, no sorrow, no pain, no death, no tears in heaven because nobody's sinning. People down here, they want sinning without sickness and sorrow and pain and death and tears. Can't have it. Doesn't work that way. So, the Bible makes it clear that if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you were, in God's reckoning, buried with Him. Doesn't that indicate something died? Well, what died? You didn't die. In fact, you got new life. What was buried? It is the relationship between you and and sin, whereby sin was the controlling power in your life. And you were raised up to do what? Live a new life. Well, I got the same arms, the same feet, the same eyes, the same ears. I went out to say good morning to the bus children and the uh, Sunday school children, and, they, and several of them said in unison, good morning, Uncle Grayhead. And some bears started to come out of the woods. <laughs> I told the bears it was okay. Just... I don't get that. Well, read your Bible. Uh... So this new life is not a new body. This new life is not a new memory. That hasn't showed up. What's new about this life that I have in Jesus Christ? I now have the controlling power over sin rather than sin having the controlling power over me. Now, it doesn't mean this new life that I don't sin. It means I don't have to. This new life doesn't mean that sin is eradicated or gone. What it means is where you that are not saved can't help it, those of us who are saved can absolutely help it. Those who are unsaved are just trapped, enslaved, in bondage to sin. But those who have been saved only sin voluntarily. Only sin because they choose to do so not because there is no power to resist. Amen. Now, I want you to, to uh, turn with me. We're going to look at a few places here this morning. Turn with me to the book of Jude. It's the last book in your Bible before Revelation. Book of Jude, and just pick any chapter. They're all, they're all good. <laughs> book of Jude, chapter 1, and verse number 3. Jude chapter 1 and verse number 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, every saved person has one thing in common, salvation. They don't have much else in common, but they have salvation in common. The common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, now what does this mean? This means that before the writing of the New Testament was finished, the salvation that all Christians have in common was under attack. Didn't take long. 
And the attack is not an attack on how people get saved. The attack is on the results of being saved. Watch carefully. Look at verse number 4. 4, 4. See, now look. It's needful for me to write unto you, 4. I have to exhort you, 4. You need to earnestly contend with the faith for. There's a reason why I'm writing for you. There's a reason why you have to fight. For there are certain men crept in unawares who are before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Well, that's a big word with a lot of vowels. What does it mean to turn the grace of God into lascivious? Lascivious conduct is perpetual, habitual, constant sin. What were these men teaching? Since God saves by grace, it doesn't hurt to sin. Since God forgives sin... Just go ahead and do it, and God will forgive it. Since God is love, He'll love whatever you do. You know what the Bible says about these mega church pastors in the book of Jude? You know what the Bible says about these liberal ministers in the book of Jude? You know what the Bible says about these parents that want to twist and turn the leadership of a church so they accommodate sin? They're ungodly. That is, they are against God in their teaching about God. God says, I saved you by grace so I could deliver you from sinning. So if someone comes in and says, God saved you by grace, so keep sinning, or don't feel bad if you keep sinning, or don't let anybody judge you or condemn you if you're sinning. The Bible says the person who would teach that in a private conversation or in a church setting is ungodly. They are opposed to God, and therefore the people who are on God's side need to oppose them. What he said. Verse number four says, Ungodly men turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only... Now, now watch carefully. I, I'm going to read this to give the modern liberal professing Christian an alibi. You ready? And denying the only God and Jesus... You understand there is a God in the United States of America today who doesn't care what you do, who doesn't care how you live, who's not going to correct anything you do because this God is just a great big Barney, Santa, lovey-dovey, give you a big hug kind of a God. And there's a Jesus out there. You want to commit adultery? There's a Jesus that's okay with it. You want to lie and cheat and steal? There's a Jesus who's okay with it. You want to ignore the Bible and drop out of church and go to the lake or the beach instead of the house of God on a Sunday? There's a Jesus for that. Let's read the verse as it's written. Denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have a God who is Lord, He makes the rules. If you have a Jesus Christ who is the Lord, He tells you how to live. Now, I can understand someone who had only read as far as Romans chapter 3 verse 20 being resentful of a God who wants to be the Lord. Because the God of Romans 1, 1 to 3, 20 says, you're wrong about that, you're wrong about that, you're wrong about that, you're wrong about that, and I'm going to 
bring upon you the wages of sin, which is death. I am going to sentence you to eternal condemnation because of those things you're doing. I could see why people would want a different God. But if you kept reading, and read Romans 3.21 to Romans 5.12 and saw that this God took upon himself the form of a man and suffered and bled and died on a cross to save you from that sin and save you from that condemnation and save you from that judgment and save you from that hell fire. And he commended his love towards you and his grace and his mercy and he washed you in his blood and gave you everlasting life. Amen. How could you object to someone who had done that for you, now wanting to say, let me teach you how to live. Let me show you how to conduct your life. I can see why you wouldn't trust a God who would condemn you to hell, but how can you not trust a God who would save you from it solely by His grace and by His power? If that grace pulled me out of everlasting fire and now that grace wants to pull me out of habits and attitudes and practices that were taking me to that fire, why wouldn't I trust that grace? So when I read Lord God, it doesn't bother me. I've proven I don't know how to live. If he wants to tell me how to live, I'll take it. I've proven that my way ends in some very unpleasant circumstances. If he wants to tell me how to walk a better way, I'm all for it. I want to show you three passages in your Bible that indicate that when people got saved back in Bible times, it was common knowledge that they weren't saved to go to heaven, but they were saved from the life they were living so they could live a new and a better life. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse number, oh, verse number 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So I don't even know what some of those things mean. Well, the, the point's well taken. You can't say, I don't, I, I'm not a sinner. You don't even know what all the sins are. <laughs> you say, well, I've done some of those things. You've probably done more than some of them. You just don't know it yet. Now watch, verse 11, and such were some of you. But you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Look what he said. Romans 1, Romans 2, first half of Romans 3, this is what you're doing and it's why you're lost. Romans chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, but I justified you. I washed you in my blood. I saved you. Romans 6, which means you don't do those things anymore. 1 Corinthians 6 says, such were some of you. Not, and some of you are still just the same, but you're saved. You're still just like you were, but you're justified. That's not the common salvation. That is not the salvation taught by the apostles, by the New Testament, by God's people for 2,000 years. 
you are buried with Christ, the old life is dead, and you're raised up, not a reincarnation of the old life, but a brand new life. That's what I was, this is what I am. That's what I did, this is what I do. Amen. You aren't saved by your works, but you should be able to see by your works that you've been saved. Right. You are not saved by your works. The world should be able to see by your works that you have been saved. Amen. You're not saved by your works. God should be able to see by your works that you've been saved. Amen. Look at Titus chapter number 3. Book of Titus chapter number 3. Titus chapter 3, verse number 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, Everyone here has done one of those things. Some have done all of those things. Some of us have one, done one of those things many, many times. I'd say foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Sounds to me like just everyday life everywhere you look. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Now, you, now look, see what he said in verse 3? This is what we were, but then God saved us by His grace. What's, what's the plain truth of the wording? Salvation doesn't leave you like you were. It changes you into someone you were not. Keep reading in the passage. Come down to verse number verse number 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Can you be saved by works? No. Can you be saved by good works? No. What is the expectation of the Savior that as soon as you are saved, your works change from bad to good? Your conduct changes from sinful to righteous. Your position changes from ungodly to siding with God. Amen. Amen. We're all in on that. You know, e even in our society, as far gone as it is, the world still has an understanding of this that the church has abandoned. When you witness to people, the ones that begin to seriously consider the gospel say, I don't want that because I'd have to give up this. I don't want that because I'd have to quit this. I don't want to live that life because I want to keep doing what I'm doing. How sad that when one of those people falls under conviction and they know they're sinning and they know that what they're doing is against God, they get invited by a friend to one of these flip-flop churches and the minister talks them out of whatever conviction the Holy Spirit has wrought and said, oh no, oh no, you don't have to give up anything. Oh no, you don't have to change anything. Why look at us, we're just as ungodly as you are. We're just as worldly as you are. We never judge you. Our God would never judge you. 
and they go to church on a Sunday morning and get talked out of what the Lord was trying to do in their life. You know what God expects? If you're lost, nothing but faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you're saved, nothing short of obedience to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Take a look in your Bible in Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. This man was preaching to a nation that had all the form of godliness and was about to lose his, his last blessing upon them because they'd just quite worn, worn out God. He'd taken all he could take. They still had their temple. They still had their priesthood. They still had their sacrifices. They still had their, their holy days. But everything they did, they did contrary to the Lord. And he's, he's going to send them to Babylon for 70 years to learn to have God without all the outward show. And that it's better than having all the outward show and not having God. Take a look at what uh, Jeremiah has to deal with here. In Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse number 8. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. That's easy to sum up. They didn't believe the Bible. They believed anyone who criticized the Bible. They didn't believe what God wrote in his book. They believed anybody that told them the book wasn't right. Sometimes you're surprised that one of our young people comes of age and then they walk away from, from God and from the church. And, well, it's, it's not hard to explain. They believe the critics of the Bible, not the Bible. They believed friends who told them not to trust this book instead of the book. That's easy. That's easy. No, no, no more difficult explanation more than that. Verse 9. Now watch. Watch, watch the mega church. Watch the modern church. Watch the emerging church. Watch the TV minister. Hundreds and hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house? You know what they're doing? They are living six days a week in defiance of God, and then walking into the house of God on the Lord's day as though he's okay with them being there and they belong there. Come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Do you see that? That's Jude chapter 1 verse 4. I'm free. I'm delivered. I can do what I want. That's true. Why do you want to do what God told you not to do? Why do you want to do what God said is going to harm you? Why do you want to do what God said will wreck your home? Well, you can't judge me. I'm free. You can't condemn me. I'm delivered. You can't tell me what I'm doing is wrong. I'm saved. You're not modern. You're outdated. That philosophy predates Jesus Christ by hundreds of years. The idea of walking into a building dedicated to God and participate in a service that claims to be for the worship of God and boasting that God approves of your misconduct, that's old as the hills. What did the Lord say about it? Verse number 11, is this house 
which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. God said, I see people who disobey me all week long walk into my house and tell me they love me. I see them walk into my house and tell me they believe in me. I see them walk into my house and, and tell, tell me that I don't care about what they've done. You know what the Lord said? You have changed my house into something that suits you when it's supposed to be something that suits me. I didn't ask you to convert my church into something your lost neighbors would approve of. I ask you to make my house something I approve of. Well, this Bible's right on time, and it, this Bible's so up to date. You say, well, <coughs> well, you know, that's the, that's the old mean judgmental God of the Old Testament. And we don't have the mean judgmental God of the Old Testament. We have Jesus, and Jesus loves. He just loves. Loves. Is there anything that comes after that? What, what does he love? Come to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. The loving Jesus, several hundred years after mean Jeremiah, the gracious Jesus several hundred years after that mean, judgmental God of Jeremiah's day, he visits the temple. And he walks in to see how things are going in the house of God. The Bible says in verse 45, he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Now, now listen. You say, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. I like the Jesus of the New Testament. God said in Jeremiah chapter 7, You are... You are not conducting yourself properly in my house. And Jesus walked in there and looked around and said, I see you're still not doing right in my house. Yeah, man. Amen. You know who Jesus is? He's that Old Testament God you don't like. He's just manifest in the body of flesh. He doesn't approve of sinning sinners in his house saying he doesn't care. Right. Amen. Because he does care. Right. Now listen, there, there's not a person here this morning that isn't a sinner. Amen. But if you're saved, you're not happy about that. Right. If you're saved, you're not comfortable with that. If you're saved, you're not looking for approval you're looking for God to teach you and strengthen you and help you and guide you and deliver you so you can stop doing what displeases Him. Amen. Amen. We're not coming to church so some sinner can tell us the big guy upstairs is cool with it. We don't need that prissy stuff. We need truth from the Word of God. Now, when the Bible says he began to cast out them that sold therein, them that bought, don't you think it's odd that Jesus would take action against the house of God raking in the money? I mean, there, there's obviously there's big bucks to be made just letting people sin and come to the house of God. And letting people commit iniquity and come to the house of God. 
And it's almost like Jesus said, I don't want your money if you're not going to be righteous. Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21. Verse number 12. Matthew 21, 12. And Jesus went to the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the, change, uh, the uh, uh, tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house should be called the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. How about that? But keep reading. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. You know what that means? That means the people running the thing. Listen now. The people running the thing didn't care if anybody got helped or not. They didn't care if anybody's lives were made better or not. They were content to let those people come and go just like they were. The only time they got discontent is when Jesus interrupted the flow of the money. This isn't a big dollar message I'm preaching this morning. This isn't a take up an offering message I'm preaching this morning. Those people came in blind and left blind while the money racket was going on. Those people came in lame and left lame while people were filling that house with sin and iniquity and ungodly attitudes. And once Jesus got that mess run out of the temple, people's lives began to change. The blind went home with sight, the lame went home walking, the deaf went home hearing. You know what Jesus wants? He doesn't want you to come to church. He wants you to come to church and leave differently. He wants you to come to church and be changed by his power. It's what he's able to do, it's what he wants to do. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Verse number 15. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went to the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house? should be called of all nations the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. You know what they want? They want a house of God without God. They want a temple dedicated to the Lord, but they don't want a Lord. They want to claim that they're worshiping somebody, but they don't want that somebody to have any say in what they do in their lives. You know what Jesus said to those people? Get out of my house, get out of my house, get out of my house, get out of my house. Now who are these people in the house of God telling our teenagers... It doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter how you dress. It doesn't matter what you watch. It doesn't matter where you go. And if you quarter them, oh, I, love the, I love God. I, I, I believe in Jesus. Which one? Which one? The lascivious Jesus or the holy Jesus? The one that saves you from sin or the one who saves you so you can sin? Which Jesus? God's blessed us with a youth pastor who believes the Bible. His wife believes the Bible. And, and, and they've been a tremendous help to us. And, and constantly, constantly, 
families come through and they want us to change the Word of God because their 17-year-old doesn't like it. They want us to revise the Bible position because their 16-year-old is a little pouty. Don't bring that vessel in here. Don't carry that vessel through this, through this temple. Doesn't belong here. Doesn't belong here. Every now and then, <laughs> like once a week, someone said, preach, you have to preach that, you have to preach against that, you have to say it that way. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. If you don't want to hear the word of God, there's a hundred buildings open this morning where you can go and, and, and enjoy this lascivious God who's not anybody's Lord. Somehow, somehow, somewhere, there needs to be a house of prayer established for the purpose of worshiping a Savior who saves us from a life of ruin to a life of blessing. That's the objective. And the scripture says, in verse number 36, the scribes, 18, I'm sorry, verse 18, the scribes and the chief priests heard it and saw how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. Now, you know he went to the cross because he chose to. And he died there because he chose to. And three days and three nights later, he rose from the dead because he had the power to do so. And we're not skipping over the greatest event in history, but I, I want you to understand something. The scribes said, we've got to destroy him. And he's still here. And the Pharisees said, we've got to get rid of him, and he's still here. And the money changers said, we've got to get rid of that guy, and he's still here. He's still here. Praise the Lord. I don't want you to think that every place that has a sign out front that says house of God is a money changer operation. That Jesus is still here. He's still changing lives. He's still giving sight to the blind. He's still opening deaf ears. He's still making people that couldn't walk for God walk and leap and praise His holy name. He is still delivering men and women from death unto life, from the bondage of sin into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. But we must understand this God who saves by grace, Romans 3, 21 to 5, 12, has also, has also given us a new life, better than the old life, and he expects us to live it. Not or else, for better. For our blessing, for our health. And so Romans chapter 6 is going to tell us the means whereby God will teach a brand new born baby Christian how to live this brand new life. It's a better life. It's a better life. It's a happier life. It's a more peaceful life. It's a more joyful life. It's a life of contentment and hope. And there's so many voices, so many voices telling you let Jesus save you. Don't let him run you. Let God give you a home in heaven. Don't let him into your home down here. We reject that money changer approach. We reject that approach because we know from the book of Jeremiah it leads to bondage and captivity. And we're free and we want to stay free. Free from sin. Amen. Father, Help us, please, not to misunderstand the great benefits of salvation, not to misread this blessed book that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for saving us 
from sin. Give us victory, Lord, over sin. We do ask and we do pray in Jesus' name. And amen.